Hey everyone, before we get into today's episode, I wanna take a second to acknowledge Vouch. With over 4,000 startups insured, from napkin sketch ideas to large IPOs, Vouch is the insurer of choice for crypto companies, including L1s, L2s, DAOs, protocols, and a whole lot more. Their exclusive coverages are enhanced for crypto, covering everything from regulatory defense to smart contract vulnerabilities. With Vouch, you're not just insuring your startup, you're investing in peace of mind so you can keep on building. You'll hear more about Vouch later in the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to an episode of Empire. Super excited. We have the head of blockchain and Onyx digital assets from JP Morgan, Tyron Lobin. Welcome to the show, Tyron. Thank you so, so much for having me. Super excited to be here. Yeah, pumped about this. Um, I think the, the best place to start this episode would, would actually just be very high level. And then we can go into some of the key things that you guys are working on. And I want to get at, like the why behind what you guys are doing. So let's start with just what is Onyx and specifically like how big is this team? Why does it exist? Where in the organization, right? JP Morgan's massive enterprise. Where in the organization does your team sit? Uh, and then I think that can kick off this conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I realize that Onyx from the outside is probably this sort of nebulous, strange thing. And, you know, how does it actually relate to JP Morgan? Uh, it's actually a business unit within the bank. So we sit within our corporate and investment bank, uh, which is where our markets business is, our you know actual um, IB is as well, all our payments operations, our payments front office, et cetera. So we sit within the CIB. Uh, we actually, um, for legacy reasons, sit within our payments organization, which is why we have such a strong uh, payments angle to a lot of the 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 work that we do within Onyx, but um, it's really, especially from my perspective and the work that I do, cross firm. So we don't just work with our CIB; we also work with our retail bank, uh, so Chase within the US, uh, and more recently with our asset and wealth management group. Uh, Onyx is almost 300 people. We're about 275 people. Wow. Um, that is made up of product engineering, uh, operations, legal you know, really the gamut because um, it is a business. And so we have to, you know, ensure we're operating as such. Uh, and within Onyx, we actually have four business stripes. So, 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 uh, so four uh, sub businesses within the group. Uh, one of them is called Link. So this is uh, focused really on information flows and specifically around cross-border payments. Um, then we have our, our, basically our value transfer um, business, which is JP Morgan Coin Systems. Uh, so you would have heard about JP Morgan Coin, and we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then we have Onyx Digital Assets, which is the platform that we have for tokenizing traditional assets. And then finally, our blockchain group, which is really everything to do with Web3. We, we focus a lot within, you know, what are the Web3-like uh, innovations that are happening that we should be concentrating on as a bank and thinking about how we can be creating products around those specific solutions. So that's the, the sort of what it is. I, I guess the other question is why, you know, why do we have this big group of people uh, focused on these these specific areas and, and blockchain uh, as a technology? And that sort of goes back to when we started our blockchain group actually in 2015, just as a, you know, a small group of people, you know, it was really a handful, um, focused on new products and emerging technology. And blockchain was one of the technologies that we were looking at at the time, uh, you know, late 2015, thinking about how it could be beneficial or disruptive to JP Morgan. And through that, we actually embarked on, you know, a whole program of experimentation, ideation, analysis on the different areas of finance that this tech can actually, you know, pr either create real value for or completely change the way things uh, are done. And so over the subsequent sort of seven years, I think we we did something like 70 to 90 proofs of concepts. Um, some of them obviously that didn't go anywhere. Um, many of them actually um, have informed the work that we do today though. Uh, and then in 2020, we actually decided that we had enough proof points that this tech was meaningful enough for us as a bank that we needed to set up an entire business unit around it. Hmm. Uh, and that was the, that was actually the creation of uh, you know of Onyx. Yeah, the biggest shift that I've seen, I, I'm, I'm sure Santi remembers this, but um, I remember when you guys had Quorum, right? And Amber Balde was leading that. I think that was maybe 2017 or 2018, and that was basically a private blockchain, right? That was a fork of Ethereum. The yeah. biggest shift that I've seen 
JP Morgan take with your guys' crypto strategy or blockchain strategy is moving from a private blockchain to a public blockchain, right? Now, now you guys are actually building things and executing trades, right, on Ethereum. Tell me about that shift from private to uh, to public and why that happened. Yeah, well, I would say that it's um, it's an in-flight uh, sort of process. So we we certainly haven't certainly haven't fully shifted to public blockchains. Uh, and in actual fact, you know, the, the the trade that you're referencing was the start of a journey for us uh, that we we really feel is the right trajectory in terms of moving towards public blockchains. But you know, quite clearly, since the, the whole FTX debacle back end of last year, uh, from a regulatory perspective, that has become somewhat challenging. Uh, so for now, our our work is very centered in the permission blockchain space, and we do actually use Quorum under the hood for our tokenization platform, uh, Onyx Digital Assets for our JP Morgan coin work, uh, and and also for Link. Um, however, we've been very deliberate about ensuring that we have this, you know, public blockchain nexus as a, a very uh, sort of strong strategy for us. And so Quorum is an important part of that, that sort of mix, right? Having an EVM sidechain or a series of EVM sidechains means that we can, you know, write solidity contracts. All of our development users, the same tooling that you would use, you know, when developing on public Ethereum or Polygon or any of the other um, sort of EVM-based uh, protocols. Um, the work that we're doing is very much uh, centered around how we can think about a future state where mm. we can actually be much more focused on public blockchain once we have some things sort of proven out. And, you know, those things are, in addition to, you know, regulatory buy-in, um, you know, focus on privacy aspects, obviously KYC and AML. Uh, and so we have a, a strong identity focus there. Uh, but even things like scaling are important um, in, in some sense as well. So I would say it's a, it's a shifting and sort of evolving process for us. Uh, but permission blockchains, you know, for where we are right now, and specifically from a regulatory perspective, are the, the means by which we can actually create value and show why blockchain actually makes sense as a technology mm -hmm. for finance. Where does buy-in stop at JP Morgan for, for blockchain? Does it stop with you and the executive team is kind of like, ah, oh, Tyron's kind of playing in the sand over here. Does your, does your boss like it? Does, right? Does it go all the way to the top? Like where, where does that yeah. buy-in stop at JP Morgan? I think that one of the reasons why JP Morgan is so different to almost any other traditional finance uh, player globally um, and why we've been able to make so much progress is because we've had sponsorship right from the top. I mean, Jamie Dimon himself is, you know, he is the one who has been championing from the, from the early days that blockchain technology can be really impactful. Um, Onyx itself, um, you know, that is a business that has been created through support from both Jamie Dimon and our C the CEO of our CIB, Daniel Pinto. And so, there is a, a huge, um, you know, sort of support base at the senior le levels of J.P. Morgan around the work that we're doing, and so I think that mandate is something that has given us the ability, really, to one have the early stage experimentation, but two transform that into something where we can actually generate revenue for the bank and for our clients, and obviously get cost savings. Um, so as much as I'd like to say, you know, the buck stops with me. <laughs> Um, and there's definitely, there's definitely people above me that are, are supportive as well. Um, well, Tyron, I'd love to deconstruct a lot. There's three different components, four different components that I heard you talk about that you guys are focused on. Maybe if you could just give us a brief, brief overview of what those mean, and then we can dive deeper into some of those as we go. I'll jump into the, the, the four aspects of Onyx. So, um, we'll start with this problem that we have identified around payments, right? Specifically international payments. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about it, there is not really a global payments infrastructure. There's a, a sort of mishmash of, you know, local networks um, that are specific to a country that in the most uh, case work very well, but when you actually get into cross-border, they actually start to break down. And so the global financial services um, and, and specifically payments infrastructure is really a connection of correspondent banks and you know, different ledgers that are not connected. And this challenge means that when you're actually looking to make a, an international payment, it's a multi-day process. Um, you know, it, it obviously has high, fee, high fees, 
for anyone who's trying to you know send money internationally, it's not exactly the the best thing you're going to do in your life. Um, and so really, we looked at this and we thought, well, you know, clearly, if you take a look at what a blockchain is, this shared ledger, this shared infrastructure, if you can have these international correspondent banks sharing that same information, having real time visibility of uh, the, you know, the information associated with a payment, you can actually start to simplify a lot of what it means to move money internationally. And so that's really where a big focus of ours is on the on this link platform that we have. Then we come into you know just money in general, um, and here we here we're actually looking looking at the you know, the physical movement of of money. Um, obviously, everything is electronic pretty much, but ultimately you need to move money from my account sitting here in London to you know you're sitting in New York, and that again sort of runs into the same challenge of. There is not a global payments ledger or a set of infrastructure that talks to each other very seamlessly. And you know we're all very familiar with stable coins and just you know cryptocurrencies in general and how it's so easy to move value when you're using blockchain technology. That's really what we've brought to you know wholesale payments in the form of JP Morgan coin. Mm-hmm. And then and then uh, on the uh, tokenization front, here we're thinking about the financial markets in general, right? So when you look at security settlement, all of the post-trade activity that is involved in you know, transferring ownership of one security uh, from you know, one party to another, it's an incredibly complex web of actors, participants. Uh, you, know, you obviously have broker dealers, custodians, you have central securities depositories. In some cases, you have transfer agencies. All of these actors exist really to do uh, one thing at, at its core, which is when I'm selling a share to you, the, that those records basically need to be updated to say you are the new owner. Uh, and that is complex to do when you have this disparate infrastructure and these disparate players. And you know, again, when we look at what blockchain technology can bring, this sort of shared ledger, and if you think about just any basic token that encodes within a, the ownership of that token, Quite clearly, that's a uh, you know a model that seems very interesting and something that can be highly impactful to this idea of moving you know, financial assets around. So that's a big focus for us. And then obviously all of the Web three side of things relating to identity and DeFi, we think that those can be impactful in in new ways that traditional finance has not actually been able to you know tap into just yet. Yeah, how much of that is internal versus coordinating with other banks? Um, I would say that. Uh, so two things here. One is obviously, you know, JP Morgan is a very broad set of uh, businesses. We have a markets business, we have a custodian, we have our payments business, we have an asset manager. What that means is we can move quite quickly by ourselves. You know, we can actually prove out things because we have the end-to-end lifecycle. Right. Of course, we're not here to just you know, in, uh, like create a blockchain infrastructure within JP Morgan. I mean, that's unnecessary. We, we can just use regular databases. Um, but it does give us the proof points to say this idea actually makes sense and it has you know, moved the needle for us as a set of businesses. So that takes us to the second point, which is you know, once we have a, a stronger idea around um, some specific uh, you know, solution, we can actually start to bring in other players as well. So you know, the Onyx Digital Assets Platform, for example, has you know, global broker dealers signed up. Uh, Goldman Sachs is on the platform, BNP is on the platform, uh, DBS, for example. Uh, We have a number of others that we haven't been uh, sort of public about, but also large asset managers. So BlackRock, as an example, um, you know, they are tokenizing or looking to tokenize money market fund shares through the Onyx digital assets platform. So it's very much a platform and our strategy is, um, you know, being able to do this for the industry and with the industry. Right. When, when you are talking to some of these broker dealers um, or clients about the benefits or even internally with someone like Daniel Pinto or Jamie, like what is the, like the, the proof point, the ROI, tangible ROI that you tell them? Like, how do you, how do you sell this internally? How do you sell this to the market of, Hey, well, look, we're saving X amount of basis points uh, per trade, or we can let, you know, we can streamline operations and compliance by X percent. Like how do you, maybe if you can just share some of the, like proof points uh, yeah. around some of these pilots would be great. 
Yeah, uh, and it varies. You know, it varies by use case. Um, so let me start by saying um, we're processing about between one to two billion dollars a day of tokenized assets through our Onyx Digital Assets platform. Uh, since we launched in 2020, uh, we processed almost um, almost 900 billion dollars worth of assets, and so. That sort of like you know goes to show the scale at which we can move assets and we can actually bring these new use cases to life. And the reason why in this specific case um, for you know what we're actually doing on the platform here is actually making it cheaper for our clients and even for JP Morgan to get access to liquidity intraday. So the specific use case is you know we have clients who borrow funds from JP Morgan during the day, uh, you know for whatever purposes they need. Oftentimes, they borrow those funds on an unsecured basis, meaning they don't have to put up collateral. They're basically just drawing down on a, on a credit line. Um, but that can be expensive, especially for our bank and broker-dealer uh, clients who ultimately would then have to hold uh, some reserves on their own balance sheets to prove to regulators that in times of stress, if JP Morgan withdraws that credit line, they can still actually make those payments. And so that cost, that cost of capital, is something that they have to sort of, you know, wear in some sense. What we can actually now provide is the ability for them to enter into an intraday uh, borrowing facility where they are actually putting up collateral and, and being able to borrow against that. But they're able to do it using a standard financial instrument, a repo, a repurchase agreement, which is, you know, one of the most widely used financial instruments in the, in the financial services market. But where, where this becomes a challenge to use in you know, regular way life is that a repo is not something that can settle in the same day, i.e. I can't give you assets as collateral and you give me cash. And then at the end of the day, we do the reverse. Like I give you your, you know, your cash back. With blockchain and specifically with smart contracts and this idea of tokenizing traditional assets, we can actually now do that. We can tokenize US treasuries. We can tokenize cash in the form of JP Morgan coin. Uh, and we can actually, you know, instantiate these assets as smart contracts and this trade as a smart contract. And now you can have very, very precise times as to when you're going to enter into the trade and when the funds are going to be returned. And so what that actually looks like specifically is a reduction in cost, right? You can actually show the basis points um, reduction. And we estimate that, you know, by, by the end of next year for our markets business, there'll be a saving on the order of like $20 million dollars. So it's not like you know massive in the grand scheme of things, but it's not immaterial either. And so we use right. these proof points to actually you know build out further use cases and and expand into other asset types as well. And, and like that's internally, but like if if you're a client where you're entering that repo facility, I would assume that there's also benefits for them, right? In terms of flexibility or ease of you you know, I don't know maybe better terms versus working with another bank, I guess. Right. I mean, it's it's this idea of um, can I get access to capital in a lower cost way? Can I be more efficient with my capital? You know, instead of having to lock it up overnight, can I actually get a access to those assets today? Um, and can I be more precise about how I'm going to be using my funding? All of those things, especially in a you know in a kind of tightening rate environment or in times of stress around liquidity, become really really important and, and actually impactful. And then the, the additional thing is this idea of added utility, right? All of a sudden, you can use your assets in a way that you couldn't use them before. And we're seeing this specifically in the asset manager community where, you know, we have asset managers like BlackRock who are looking to tokenize money market fund shares. And the reason why they, they're looking to do that is because they want to provide utility to their investors who are actually looking to... You know, potentially pledge those shares as collateral instead of redeeming out of the fund, going to get access to cash, now going to post out cash as collateral. The investors can just stay invested uh, and use those shares in a way that they couldn't have. And so it's not only like the cost savings, but it's the additional utility that these clients are able to get and, and actually offer to their own clients. Just uh, to give folks a sense of perspective on the number of um, you, you mentioned this figure close to a trillion dollars, like up to this point, I believe. Like, yeah, th that's what I mean. That's still a very small percentage of the aggregate flow that you guys are handling. But how does that trend line looked over the past couple of years? Um, and and how do you think about that evolution going forward, like in the next five, ten years? 
Yeah. And also I'd be uh, curious to hear Tyron, how, how much do you, how much do you guys process in a day? Like, is it five trillion, 10 trillion? Like, what, what, what is the magnitude here? You know? Yeah. 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 Um, so in terms of like the, the trajectory and the growth we've seen in the first half of the year, uh, in 23, we processed as much as we processed through the whole of 22. Um, so that, you know, is, is quite a significant, um, uptake and that's, through a couple of things. One is, you know, more clients coming onto the platform, but also clients seeing more value and actually looking to use it uh, more frequently than what they were. So, and I think we're going to see, um, you know, maybe that double through next year. So the trajectory is, is fairly strong and, you know, you're totally right. Like this is still sort of small numbers in the, in the grand scheme of things, but I think the proof point is real, right? Like the fact mm -hmm. that we have global clients looking to use these products and in some sense, almost not caring that it's blockchain, right? They just want access to this new feature basically right. um, is, a, is a really strong signal for us. Um, in terms of like, you know, what this actually looks like from a magnitude perspective. So in the payments business, we process, so in the traditional payments business, this is, you know, yeah. completely away from blockchain, just our traditional payments flows. We process $10 trillion every day. And, you know, so that's a big number. And I think this is also a reason why, you know, we have started to look at creating different types of payments products that are not quite stablecoin like, right? And by that, I mean, when, I, when we talk about JP Morgan coin, what we're actually talking about is a blockchain based bank account. Like it's a, it's a really bad name, JP Morgan coin, because it's not actually a coin. It's just a blockchain based account. And it means that it's a deposit, you know, th that represents a deposit liability uh, from JP Morgan's perspective. And so, you know, our institutional clients who can now access JP Morgan coin basically have all of the guarantees that they would have um, for any other money that they hold with JP Morgan. And that means that we can start to think about the scale of, you know, this $10 trillion of payments that we possibly couldn't get to if we were just implementing a pure you know, fully reserved stable coin, uh, like instrument. Tyron, what are your thoughts on USDC? And it's obviously had a tremendous amount of success, but what are, it sounds like when I hear you talk about kind of tokenized deposits, that's almost a different take on how to build a stable coin in a sense. Yeah. What's, what's your take on almost the pros and cons of USDC? I, I think USDC is obviously incredibly important for the, the crypto industry, right? I mean, it is in, in my sense, pretty much the, the killer app of sort of retail crypto um, because it does solve the, the key problem of moving money and moving money quickly and cheaply. And, you know, we spoke a little bit about how challenging that is in the, the current infrastructure, the current environment, because of this, like, you know, basically uh, very fragmented uh, set of payment solutions. So I think having USDC and specifically having um, you know, a reputable company in Circle actually offering that solution now. Now in other currencies, you know, obviously they have Eurocoin, which is uh, still growing, but it's a really, really important proof that this technology can make a real difference. And in, in, in this case, from a retail perspective, I think where and you know this this sort of thesis still needs to be played out. But I think where USDC is going to hit a cap is going to be at scale. So when I talk about the ten trillion dollars that we're processing every night, and I, you know, I was looking this morning. I think the the market, uh, sorry, the twenty four hour volume for both USDC and USDT is like twenty five billion dollars or something. That's like four hundred times less than what we do every day. And if you think about having to fully reserve ten trillion dollars. Uh, to be able to make those payments every day, that's a lot of liquidity that you're taking out of the system. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, really actually has a negative impact and you can't really start to create uh, credit creation. Like you can't actually enact credit creation and issue auto loans and mortgages mm -hmm. if you have this huge balance of liquidity that's locked up. So I think that USDC has, you know, 100% a place to play. I don't know that in its current construct, it can play at the institutional level, which is really where, you know, I think a bank like JP Morgan comes in and starts to offer a slightly different product, but has the same, same benefits. So what yeah. you're basically saying I is think, uh, USDC is not, for, it's, what you're saying is there needs to be a stable coin, but with a, built on a fractional reserve system. 
Yeah, I mean, that, it, it, the, right? the common criticism of DeFi has been it's it's highly inefficient because you can't do this fractionalization. Yeah. It's it's fully collateralized, and attempts to do under collateralization have failed because there it's sort of this civil problem. You don't know who's at the other end of the. You interact with Ava, you don't know who's on the other, the counterparty, right? So one of the things that I've thought about is, okay, what's it going to take for JP Morgan to settle stuff on chain with Goldman or with a hedge fund X or Y in a hybrid type of environment where it's maybe like a permission version of Ave, where yeah. you're using a Switzerland L1, call it Ethereum, uh, but you know your counterparty Hey, if there's ever a dispute, like the smart contract logic is very clear. Yeah. So that, to some extent, minim- allows you to do certain things that you can with the traditional financial system, meaning things close, you know, on the weekend and yep. after hours and whatnot. But if there's ever a dispute, you know who the counterparty is. You can go to court. Like credit has always throughout history been enforced with violence or perceived level of violence at the end of the day. Um, so what's it going to take to for you guys and for Goldman and other institutions to, do you think that that is likely the, the evolution where you guys end up tapping into DeFi or do you say, Hey, look, no, that's going to exist on this for, for these kind of on the fringes. We're going to build our own um, with other financial institutions, use our network, but maybe tap into Ethereum through a side chain or something. Like how, how do you guys think of all that? I mean, what you're describing is is almost exactly what we did last year under this project called Guardian with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Um, and you know what we essentially did was uh, we created tokenized deposits, deposit tokens of both Singapore dollars and Japanese yen. Uh, we issued those onto the Polygon mainnet. We uh, stood up a specific version of the Aave Arc protocol that has you know, permissions in terms of who can actually access uh, the, the, the DeFi pools. Um, we created pools for both yen and, and dollars, uh, Singapore dollars. And then we built in this identity system using verifiable credentials that all together showed how traditional financial services can actually interact with DeFi in a compliant way. Because as you said, like, if you can get to that, if you can get to the transparency and trust that those protocols can offer with a, a persistent, highly available, highly redundant settlement rail like Ethereum, um, well, that has to be a better better infrastructure than what you could otherwise have, right? And and, and, mm-hmm. and pretty much what we have today. And so the test was you know, highly instructive for us in terms of uh, working out how to actually use these pools, how to do this, in a, in, as I said, in a, a, a compliant way. Um, and, you know, it also showed us some things that still need to improve. Uh, one of them, you know, we actually hit this problem during the test where there was this massive NFT drop on, on Polygon mm-hmm. through, I yeah, think it was like Reddit. The spike in fees was... Uh... Right. We had this like, FX transaction that was sort of like waiting there. <laughs> We're like, okay, let's up the gas and, and yeah. try and get this thing through, which is fine for a test, but, you know, you can't really operate at scale uh, and you can't do anything mm-hmm. that is time sensitive. You know, when I spoke about the... Uh, the repo uh, product that we have, those are very, very time sensitive trades, right? You, you actually need to settle at a specific time. And so uh, scalability is important, having the ability to you know, not be impacted through the sort of like noisy neighbor problem is important. Privacy is highly important. You know, there's obviously a big discussion in the, in the community around privacy. And obviously from a financial services perspective, like we can't have the position where you know, our competitors can see our, our trading position. Yeah for example. Um, so privacy is one. And then, you know, clearly the KYC aspect is something that we have to abide by from a regulatory mm-hmm. perspective um, and ensuring that we're not enabling money laundering. So right. those are some of the things that need to come into being in a, a more robust way for us to mm-hmm. actually be able to fully step into, you know, a public DeFi or public blockchain mm-hmm. environment. But, you know, as I was saying at, at, at the top, this is actually why we have set ourselves up in the way that we have. Because we do think that there is a path there and we want to build all of our products and infrastructure to be compatible so that we can effectively right. lift and drop. Yeah. I was going to ask you on the privacy stuff. I mean, obviously, this has been a persistent problem in the industry. Like, you know, front running is a big problem and you don't want to ever show your competitor what trades you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, is there an active effort within the organization to... to create a solution around that or are you waiting 
for others to kind of leverage zero knowledge proofs or something to where you can adopt and, and integrate? We've been um, active around privacy probably for six or seven years now. Uh, so, you know, Jason, you mentioned the Quorum protocol. Actually, in 2017, we were, I think, the first people to implement zero knowledge proofs yeah. on an Ethereum blockchain. And we actually basically grafted the, the Zcash protocol onto Quorum to show that you could have these privacy preserving transactions where you don't actually know the, the amount that's been transacted or you know, who, who the parties are. Um, that was a, a POC that was difficult to progress for a number of reasons, specifically around where zero knowledge proofs were at the time. It was very, very costly to generate them, took a long time, hard to write the circuits, et cetera. Um, we actually did some work a few years later, um, basically adopting the Zether protocol, or the Zether paper that came out of Stanford, and we implemented something called anonymous Zether, which is a more effective and a more efficient way. It basically uses bulletproofs to prove privacy as well as uh, you know maintain anonymity, uh, and that was actually highly, um, I think, you know, probably one of the, the pieces of work that we've done that was the most promising but had a, a very high demand in terms of, you know, skill set. We just don't have the deep, you know, very, very large cryptography teams internally that you would need to put that out at scale. So we've contributed that to the community that's like fully open sourced uh, for people to go and build on. Um, and, you know, to answer the question, we haven't seen anything just yet that can actually solve the problem. Very, very open and willing to work with people in the community who are looking at this because it is, you know, obviously foundational for us, but we just haven't seen anything that can, you know, operate robustly at scale just yet. What's your perfect vision for how identity would work in crypto, Tyron? Is it because the, I think the key is, right, having an identity on chain while preserving privacy, which is much tougher than yeah. people realize. So what's, what's your vision for kind of the perfect solution that you'd love to see? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit biased towards, uh, and maybe maybe sort of uh, too much so, towards verifiable credentials. Uh, so verifiable credentials, uh, you know, for those who don't know, basically now a W3C recommendation, um, which basically means that the W3C as like, you know, the, the premier body for the internet uh, standardization um, is recommending to use verifiable credentials for identity you know, claims, et cetera. And basically they are a cryptographic proof of something about you or something about, you know, your organization that is irrefutable. So if you tell me, uh, you know, or if I tell you I work at JP Morgan and I present to you a credential that says I am a JP Morgan employee, you can cryptographically prove that. Uh, you know, you don't have to rely on me. It's all embedded in the, in the crypto, you know, private key signatures. And so I think that verifiable credentials are very interesting um, for a few reasons. One, they do maintain privacy, right? So when you're actually uh, holding a credential that you need to present to someone else, you're never really giving them that credential and you're never having to store it in some place that you know, many people can access and that your data can sort of be put at risk through you know, hacking or theft. Uh, it's also technology agnostic. So, and, and this is actually a really important point. The, the way I think that crypto becomes, you know, actually has the step change in terms of bigger adoption and broader usage is more integration in, into the Web2 world, right? More integration into today's world. And this idea of identity and being able to sort of cross the boundaries, you know, I'm Tyron Lobin in the real world. I also want to be Tyron Lobin and prove that these are my crypto assets when I want to go and do something. I don't want to have this sort of bifurcation. Um, verifiable credentials have this nice property of being technology agnostic. And so I could use my proof of my name or proof of my address when I'm logging into like, you know, I don't know, my regular way bank account. And I can also use it when I'm trying to prove that I am a reputable person in this DeFi protocol. And, you know, I, I'm good for the, the amount of money that I'm going to be borrowing. Um, so I, I think that Something like verifiable credentials is is important, but you know the space is still emerging, and, and there's quite a lot of research that's going on as well. All right, everyone, wanted to talk about Vouch again, our favorite insurance provider for crypto companies. If you are building in crypto, you have probably come to realize that contracts need insurance, partners demand insurance, and as a founder myself, trust me when I say you owe it to not only yourself but your investors and your clients and your customers. 
And I'm not just talking about any insurance. Their exclusive coverages are tailored specifically for crypto companies that can address issues like protections for regulatory defense, recognizing DAOs as insured, addressing smart contract vulnerabilities, and even covering the loss of digital assets. They're in it with you, whether you're working on L1s, L2s, DAOs, MPC wallet providers, building a protocol, and a lot more. So whether you're just scribbling your next big idea on a napkin or gearing up for a big fundraise or maybe thinking about that IPO or an acquisition, don't leave things to chance. Get insured today with 5% off vouches exclusive coverage for Empire listeners using code Empire. Think about it this way. With Vouch, you're not just insuring your startup, you are investing in peace of mind. Yeah. So a lot of what you're talking about are things that I think the front end consumer won't see. They'll see it maybe in the savings or they'll see it in trade settling faster, but they don't actually use it. When you look at kind of what's happening across the industry, you, you uh, who was it? Citadel, I think. Citadel, Fidelity, and Schwab are building that supposed crypto exchange. You have, I've heard of a couple of the biggest, you know, Web2 companies building their own wallets, kind of like almost a fork of what feels like MetaMask. Have you guys thought yep. about what a, a front facing crypto product from JP Morgan would, would look like? Yeah, we've actually thought about that a lot because, you know, and I'll, I'll sort of, frame this in the, from the point of view that within Onyx, we sort of have this freedom to go and try and work out like what that future looks like. And even if that future can be somewhat disruptive to, you know, our existing businesses, for example. Um, but the way that we've thought about, you know, this uh, identity and, and sort of wallet space is actually that these things should all really come together. Ultimately, we think that, you know, if you could have a, a, a wallet, that had both of your digital assets, your you know personal assets like NFTs, whatever the case is, as well as your identity credentials, all in one, you can actually start to get a much better you know usage of your value, right? The things that you care about the most in your life. And so, we actually built a prototype mobile wallet that really brings these things together. Uh, you know, brings together your NFTs, brings together your verifiable credentials, brings together your digital assets. Um, and, and sort of showed how you could do illustrative things like, I don't know, take out a loan um, where the credit score was based on the credentials that you had in your wallet and also the value of your crypto assets. So you could, you know, basically reduce your loan to value in some sense. Um, so that's not a, a product that we've actually taken to market, but it's a, a very sort of strong, you know, sort of indicator as to how we think about these things coming together. And I think that that's where it's going to go. And actually, in the last mm. sort of year or so, you've seen companies starting to put out, you know, digital wallets that are not just, you know, for crypto, but also some identity aspects as well. Mm. I'd love to zoom out and just get your take on just as someone who works works on crypto, but almost outside the industry. What is your view of what's gone right and what's gone wrong right now? And, you know, there are these big conversations happening in crypto, L2s you know, DeFi apps building their, you know, app chain thesis, things like that. would love to just get your kind of zoomed out view of what you're excited about, what you think folks have gotten right, what you think folks have gotten wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, weirdly, although we sort of sit on the outside, we do a lot of work in blockchain itself. Uh, yeah. You know, my whole team is, you know, writing smart contracts and dApps and, you know, building key management solutions. And so I feel like we we also come from a point of view of, really understanding the technology. Um, and that's right from the days when we built Quorum itself. Um, I, I'm sort of like a little bit conflicted about the very, very high focus on infrastructure. Um, you know, clearly there's been a long time uh, focused on scalability, building out, you know, all the L2 solutions, you know, more recently things like, uh, you know, PBS for MEV and how you can actually optimize, you know, that whole flow um, more recently, I think very helpfully, you know, things like account abstraction come in, but I'm, I'm sort of a little bit conflicted about, is there too much focus on infrastructure and trying to do very cool technology things and not enough focus on use cases and actually trying to like move the needle for people, right? Like really just make things easier. And I think that that's been a big focus for us internally, right? We, we have to generate revenue. Ultimately, we have to show value. And that's not going to be through creating some really great, you know, technology solution that doesn't solve a problem. And so we've had to, we've sort of been forced to, uh, to take the use case first approach 
what is the actual problem that we're solving? How is this going to make things better for people? And then look to see what technology we can actually use to enable that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we spoke a little bit about this uh, project Guardian that we did last year. We actually ended up implementing um, what people now call a smart account, you know, as part of account abstraction. This was really before uh, 4337 had come out. Um, we created this contract on chain that basically represented JP Morgan um, and held the funds for JP Morgan, but didn't give traders direct access to it. Like we basically built in these rules that said, you have to prove by submitting a verifiable credential that you are an authorized trader. And all of those rules and the, the, the rules around like limit checks were built directly into the, into the smart contract. Now that's called a smart account and people you know, talk about account abstraction. Uh, which obviously has been in, in, you know, in the works for many, many years. Uh, so definitely not claiming that this is something that, that we created. But the point is that we actually started with the problem of how do we simplify for our traders the ability to actually interact with these DeFi pools as opposed to like, is there a, a cool technology sort of thing that we can create and try and retrofit that? Hmm. So I think one thing is there's been a huge amount of innovation, but sometimes I just wonder like, is it overly focused and overly indexed on infrastructure. But I also get why, right? I mean, you have to have something at scales. You have to have something that can, you know, compete with the likes of the large processing, like payments processing settlement networks. Um, but I do think that we need to go more into use cases generally. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned some specific areas that I don't think there's been enough focus on, privacy being the, mm -hmm. the primary one, at least from a traditional financial services perspective. Yeah. How do you, um, I guess on the use case uh, discussion, this is especially common in bear markets, which is like, why are you guys building this? Like, where does it all matter? I haven't seen it. And I guess you can point to NFTs and you can point to stuff like DeFi and inclusion and access and whatnot, but not really back it up with meaningful numbers uh, in terms of users. Uh, but an organization like JP Morgan, you know, largest bank in the world, like, you know, you can roll this out and and you have the distribution you have the global scale um when you think about you know you talked about the repo facility you talked about guardian like maybe just give us one or two other examples of um of use cases that that may come you know within the two you know next next couple of years without giving the secret sauce but just an illustration of what it could be possible or we could be seeing uh, down yeah. the road. I mean, obviously there's uh, now a more renewed interest and in perhaps line of sight into being be, being an approval for the Bitcoin ETF. There's a ETH ETF that was just filed recently by ARK and, and 21 shares. Um, how do you guys think about that? What what could you, in, in a state of the world where we have ETFs, like how, how would you think about your client base uh, being excited about that, having access to that, and you guys offering that in the platform? Yeah. I actually, I mean, I have a, a sort of tangential answer, which is, and maybe Jason, this goes back to a little bit about what you were asking in terms of, you know, what has the crypto industry done right and done wrong? I don't think the crypto industry has done itself any favors around creating confidence with, um, you know, large institutions, specifically, obviously, through the recent um, FTX debacle. And that obviously, as, as we all know, has nothing to do with the technology entirely, everything to do with just governance and organize and, you know, how companies are structured mm -hmm. and the compliance around them. But, you know, when you look at the, the, the very unfortunate thing was it was, you know, Alameda and FTX effectively were these poster child companies. And I think that it's going to take some time for regulators to get comfortable again. Um, not that they were ever fully comfortable, but, you know, I know that there was really so progress. Um, yeah, so regulators need to, you know, get there and large financial institutions need to get there, need to be okay with allocating capital. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are institutions today that are allocating to crypto, but it's, it's small, right? And I think some of these sort of like foundational things need to be improved before people feel comfortable. So I think the ETF is wrapped up in in a lot of that. Um, mm -hmm. Will it will it happen? You know, who's who's to know? Really, it feels like maybe. Uh, you know, given mm -hmm. everything that's happened more recently, but equally, nothing is guaranteed. Um, our focus is you know not so much around crypto investing; it's more around how can we create these new products leveraging blockchain.
Yeah. I mean, I, I guess like on this point um, of, of regulation, not, not to get too much into the weeds, but I do think you know, from your vantage point, you understand how a bank works and the different segregation within a bank. And when you're managing clients' money, like there's a very clear who's the custodian and who's the broker. De- like th- there's a very clear system within finance to, to, to precisely prevent a thing like FTX happening. Right. So I got to wonder, I mean, there, there, there's some very sophisticated investors that looked at the deal, maybe glossed over the structure and the relationship between something like Alameda and FTX. But I mean, gosh, like you almost got to think if you're looking at something like that, and I did back in the day, and, and that was a red flag for me, this, this Alameda FTX relationship. Because I, I mean, I was JP Morgan, you understand there's walls and there's processes, procedures in place, but there wasn't, there wasn't much there. So I'm curious, like, I, I don't know if you looked at the deal or not, but if you like, that's to me not a crypto problem. That's just like a lack of due diligence. That, by the way, is not only inherent in crypto. I mean, there's terrible deals that have been done in a record low interest rate environment because people are lazy. You know, it's free money, and so they just play around with it and slosh it around, uh, and it's not theirs, right? So I'm curious, um, not to be a defense, but you know, a you guys looked at that deal, and had you looked at the deal, I mean, clearly like this custodianship, and uh, there ought to be clear rules and regulations within yeah. crypto. Uh, for service providers. So, uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the deal aside, you know, I don't think that was something that, that was ever on the table for us, but mm-hmm. we have been for a long time um, sort of advocating for these clear roles and responsibilities, right. And the, yeah. the need for this, um, and this was well before, you know, anything surfaced on FTX. It's just, it's just because the market infrastructure exists today for a reason. Um, and it is around protection and it is around right. ensuring segregation of, uh, of roles and responsibilities. Where we think the the real impact is, is simplifying how those different structures can communicate. And that's where blockchain makes sense, right? It's like having the shared ledger. You can still have separate roles and responsibilities, um, but you can actually come to a decision and conclusion around like ownership transfer in a much more efficient yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, I when I, uh, a lot of my, prior friends that you know in the industry or jp morgan my alma mater like when they ever reached out and i said hey well imagine a world where you can very quickly understand who your counterparty is um and you can measure risk you can see transactions happening um and wouldn't it be nice wouldn't it be nice to minimize counterparty risk wouldn't it be nice to like be able to you know operate 24 7 365 um and and atomically settle and, and, and with if then statements, like as, as yep. you write them in Excel or yep. Python or whatever, right? And they're like, yeah, that'd be great. And, but as soon as I said crypto, they're like, no, 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 no. You know what? Like, uh, you lost me there. But, you know, and then, but you say blockchain, not crypto, and they're like, they get re engaged again. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, as a bank, you, you constantly think about counterparty risk. Um, but, you know, the issues around privacy are, are key, right? Yep. So, um, I guess, uh, all this ramble to think about like uh, within within JP Morgan like the buy in within the organization has that remained steady over the years as do you think that it has you know now given the recent events with FTX uh or just that the industry is kind of in a bear market or you know the economy or whatever has interest waned within the organization like is the buy in still strong how how is how does your group and and its role within the bank like have evolved over time and where do you see it kind of over the next couple of years? Yeah, I, I would say that the buy-in for the potential that this tech has, has increased over the past few years, um, not even maintained, it's increased. And that's because right. we've got more confident on how to deploy it, how to implement it, how to actually go live. You know, our, we, we're not talking about pilots, we're talking about BAU products that are fully integrated into our regular way banking systems. We have blockchain connected to our core infrastructure um, and we have a good understanding of, you know, what makes a good use case. So I think with that lens, we're, we're confident that, you know, we're just going to carry on. There is obviously the unfortunate, you know, noise around the more recent crypto bear market. Um, but, you know, that's going to come and go like that's that's always going to happen. We just want to make sure that we're we're really generating value for, for our clients and for JP Morgan. Yeah. Tyron, I think la- last thing to wrap this up. I know you guys have this hackathon coming up that you want to talk about. You've got you know Lens yeah. and Layer Zero, zk Sync, Magic. It's not. 
I'm not used to seeing, you know, ZK Sync Magic Layer Zero and Lens and then JP Morgan's name next to it, right? So maybe we can wrap this up by just talking about that hackathon and really what you're looking for here. Yeah. I mean, so the the participants that we have, it's um, just ZK Sync, Biconomy, um, Magic, as you said, Lens Protocol. Um, you know, I think really some of the strongest Web3 names coming together. Uh, JP Morgan, there's another large payment company that's going to be announced uh, hopefully next week. Um, really, the idea here is, you know, we think that digital identity is one of the core pieces of this new world, right? This idea of having more control over your own data, having more control over your own identity. You know, we spoke about the fact that you want to be able to prove who you are without revealing, you know, everything about yourself. Um, it's very easy in the real world for, you know, you and I to walk into a room and people are not questioning that, like, I'm the real tyrant. I mean, obviously I am in life, but when you're online, you lose all are of you? that certainty. How I, do we know you're not like a deep fake unless you have not, cryptographic not AI, to prove it? Yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> next year. Um, but exactly that, right? Like online, you lose all of that ability to trust. And so mm. we think that, um, you know, the, the crux for bringing, Web two and Web three together lies in identity, being able to bring your your you know actual self into the, the sort of crypto world, um, and being able to utilize your crypto assets in the Web two in, in the Web two kind of space as well. And so, what we wanted to do, and we've been working on you know digital identity solutions for a long time, is try and do this in a in a more sort of formal way through this hackathon. Uh, we've actually open sourced the identity infrastructure that we've created, uh, or at least, uh, you know, a part of it. And we want people to come up with cool use cases, like show us how verifiable credentials can actually make, um, you know, easier to access some under collateralized protocol and, you know, provably show that you have the, the credentials to actually borrow from you know, someone else without revealing who you are or on board in a much easier way, again, in a, in a privacy centric way. Um, there's so many areas where identity is just at the core of what we do in our day-to-day -day lives, but it's this a deliberately missing piece from crypto, right? But I think that more and more so that's going to have to change. You know, we are already seeing KYC requirements, AML requirements for some of the you know, protocols that are tokenizing real world assets, uh, quote unquote, because they want institutional investors and they want institutional uh, sort of adoption. So I think there's this huge space that can be created uh, and, and we would love to facilitate that. And, and that's really what the hackathon is about. So I, I'm sure we'll be able to post the link to, to it. You know, we're going to be kicking off on uh, September 12th. Uh, so right in the middle of the mission list next week, uh, it runs for a month online. There's about $70,000 worth of uh, you know, prizes to be won. Uh, and really, it's, uh, it's it's just centered on combining these really great Web3 protocols uh, with, you know, strong digital identity concepts and technology to show how we can actually create this new layer of trust. Yeah, awesome. That's fascinating. Byron. I think we'd all agree that uh, digital identity is super important. So it's great to see yeah. you guys spearheading that and coordinating with a lot of the top projects in the space. Yeah. Uh, any parting thoughts, Tyron? Uh, it's been a great pleasure to have you. Um, you know, always good to, to have a former JP Morgan uh, uh, friend on the pod. Uh, anything yeah. anything else you want to leave the, the audience with? Uh, otherwise, it's been a great discussion. Yeah, no, just, you know, from our perspective, um, these bear and bull markets come and go. But um, I think that what we are hopefully showing is there is real use for this technology. And, uh, you know, we have a huge focus internally. And um, I, I hope that, you know, especially through something like the hackathon, we can show how the, the traditional finance world and the sort of new Web3 world can come together in, in a really productive way. So thanks to both of you for um, for inviting me on. Always great chatting. And uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you next week in, in person at Permissionless. See you next week, guys. Thanks, Tyler. All right, folks.